Welcome everyone to today's Lunch and Learn, organised by North Cumbria Integrated Care Trust and Boost, the North East and North Cumbria Learning and Improvement Community for Health and Social Care. It's good to see you all tuning in today. My name is Richard Laurie and I'm Head of Library Knowledge Services and Education Facilities for NCIC. Um, but I'd especially like to welcome Elaine Bidmead, who's the NIHR Applied Research Collaboration North East and North Cumbria Senior Research Fellow, who is giving our session today on Poverty Proofing Healthcare, a qualitative study of barriers to accessing healthcare for low income families with children in Northern England. Um, the idea of these lunch and learns is that they're a relaxed, informal space for health and care staff to come together to share experiences, learn something new relating to health and care, focus on quality improvement be signposted for further resources, all of course whilst you uh, relax and eat your lunch if that is what you've chosen to do today. Just some protocols, so unless you're invited to do so, if you could keep your webcams off um, and then also mute when we're not speaking, that would be great, thank you. Um, we do monitor the chat during the session, so if you've got any questions that you think of or comments or issues that you'd like to add whilst we're going along, do feel free to use the chat function. We will have uh, have questions at the end, so um, you can either unmute and ask questions verbally at the end, or again, use the chat feature if you'd like to do that, and Elaine will answer any questions you have. Um, but also, if there are questions that you think of later, or there's anything you'd like to ask outside of this forum privately, Elaine's very happy to be contacted uh, to answer any questions. Um, and the final thing I think is just to make you aware of, we are recording this session, so it will be available once it's been edited afterwards for other people to watch. So if you are tuning in today and would like to share it with somebody else or share the Lunch and Learn series as a whole, please do feel free because this will be available on the Boost website in due course. Um, so without further ado, Elaine, um, I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Yes, so thank you, Richard, for that introduction. So we can skip the first slide, please. So this study is about um, poverty proofing healthcare um, in NHS and other health settings. And this matters because although access to the National Health Service is based on medical need rather than ability to pay, poorer families face barriers in accessing healthcare. Children born into the poorest fifth of families are 13 times more likely to experience poor physical health. They are at greater risk of becoming overweight, developing asthma and having tooth decay, as well as performing poorly at school. The effects of this continue into adulthood and increase the risk of premature death. These barriers mean that richer people access healthcare earlier and get more preventative and specialist care, whilst poorer families access healthcare later and experience worse health outcomes. Next slide, please. The research was done by researchers from the University of Cumbria, Newcastle and Durham in partnership with Children North East, which is a charity set up to support children and families living in poverty and who have developed a poverty proofing audit tool. The research design was qualitative using interviews and focus group we talked to 24 parents on low incomes living in the North East and North Cumbria and eight professionals working in the VCSE sector who support people on low incomes in North Cumbria. Topic guides prompted participants to think about different aspects of healthcare, including getting appointments, accessing appointments, emergency situations and staff attitudes. It also allowed them to bring up sort of things they thought were important that weren't covered by the guides. Anonymized transcripts were subjected to practical thematic analysis and the paper is available open access via that link. Next slide please. So what the research found. We grouped the things that people talked to uh, talked about into themes. There were four main themes. People talk generally about the daily struggle of living on a low income, about unexpected costs they face when they wanted to access an NHS service, about how hard they found it to get an appointment, and about how they felt about the NHS staff that they 
encountered. Next slide, please. So people talked about living in poverty and said they found it hard, stressful, embarrassing and stigmatising. Parents told us that sometimes they felt negatively judged by healthcare providers and that people made them feel bad about themselves, that you're useless, you're time wasters and scroungers. Parents also told us they felt embarrassed when they had to ask for financial help. VCSC participants emphasised the stress caused by poverty and the complex layering and cumulative impacts it has on families, which can become overwhelming. It's an overwhelm, isn't it? It's an overwhelm with lots of different factors that eat you away until you feel like you have few options. Next slide, please. Although NHS care is free, parents told us there are lots of hidden costs that make it difficult for people living on low incomes to go to their doctor, hospital and so on. These costs were things like the cost of travelling to the surgery or hospital, the expense of buying food and drinks when people had to spend long time, long periods of time at hospital, losing money because people had to take time off work to go to appointments, with VCSC staff reporting parents who had given up work because they had been unable to balance work with the needs of their child. We also found out that people often didn't know about the financial help with costs they were entitled to. And these quotes illustrate the cost for people living in rural areas and also the amounts of borrowing that people in poverty must do to cope. Next slide, please. People said that they found it hard to get appointments with doctors, dentists and mental health services. This was often because of long waiting lists, but there were other reasons that caused problems for families on low incomes. For example, the cost of waiting on hold when telephoning for appointments or not having enough credit on their mobile phone to telephone or contact their surgery online. Appointments only been available at times when they had to be at work or were looking after children. Difficulties in finding suitable childcare so that they or their other children could attend health appointments. And difficulties in navigating their way around the healthcare system when they needed to make several appointments with different doctors or nurses for different reasons. These problems were reported to result in families presenting at A&E rather than trying to access their GPs. Securing dental appointments was particularly difficult children were reported to be waiting long periods whilst they were in pain and their oral health was deteriorating. Next slide, please. Both parents and VCSC staff told us that often people find it hard to trust healthcare staff and find it particularly hard when they don't always receive their care from the same people. Parents told us that they were tight tired of having to explain themselves over and over and that they found it much easier to talk about their health with people they know and trust. Parents reported that some healthcare staff came over as judgmental and made them feel ashamed about both themselves and their situations. ECSE contributors highlighted the social distance between health professionals and some patients, with some professionals perceived as being authoritative and not really listening which they put down to issues with training and recruitment. One VCSC participant pointed to an expectation that parents can comply with healthcare provision and when they cannot, it is seen as a problem with the patient rather than the system. Next slide, please. The people we talked to told us some of the things that healthcare providers can do to make it easier for families living on low incomes to use NHS services. The main ones were making sure information on financial support that people are entitled to is easy to find, making it easier for people to get appointments by offering them at different times of the day and at weekends, having pre-bookable appointments for, for families with ongoing healthcare needs, and training healthcare staff so that they are aware, are aware of the problems families living on low incomes face when they need healthcare and so that they can treat families sympathetically. Next slide, please. So we've found that Dixon Woods <clears throat> et al's theory of candidacy is useful in framing the problems of access faced by low-income families. 
They argue that access to healthcare is jointly negotiated between individuals and health services through a series of complex processes, which I've attempted to summarize. So, individuals must first identify candidacy by appropriately appraising their symptoms, which will then inform their decisions around which services may meet their needs. Accessing the services requires navigation of a health system, so an awareness of the services on offer is needed. Also needed are practical resources such as transport or the need to contend with disruptions, for example, time off work. When individuals appear at health services, they must assert their claim to candidacy by providing an accurate description of their health problem in order to justify its appropriateness to health professionals and or others, such as receptionists, healthcare, and so on. This stage relies on the patient being able to articulate their health need appropriately and there being appointments available for them to appear at. Individuals then experience adjudications from health professionals who decide the suitability of the patient and their health problem and determine the patient's suitability for progression. All such negotiations occur in a healthcare culture where some services are more permeable than others. Next slide, please. However, candidacy, candidacy is compromised by poverty. Engaging with the healthcare system can be challenging for disadvantaged people due to its complexity and then personally lacking financial resources to cover indirect costs. Time due to other pressing commitments, caring, for example, and employment. Knowledge and information and family and social support. Candidacy can also be compromised by the health conditions themselves, especially those that reduce agency and self-esteem, such as depression. Candidacy is further compromised by the permeability of health services, that is ease of accessibility. A&E departments are seen as the most permeable. There is a lot of debate over pressures on A&E and inappropriate attendances, but where GP appointments are diminished, it is perhaps unsurprising that patients are turning to A&E. COVID-19 weakened candidacy and permeability significantly. Pandemic restrictions accelerated the move to digital healthcare, which had the paradoxical effect of both opening up and closing down access for different groups. Digital services are more difficult for people who lack digital access and literacy and use pay-as-you-go over contracted services with mobile data. Triaging has become commonplace since COVID-19, which requires people to articulate their health need convincingly, often before gaining access to a health professional or GP, for example, receptionist. This tends to favour more articulate, more confident and more persistent service users over those un unable to articulate their needs. When pe people finally do meet a health professional, they must articulate their health needs as doctors are not vets, as, a doc as the nurse once explained to my stepdad. Adjudications are made on the basis of people's articulations, but may also be built on judgments of deservedness based on an individual's health behaviours, for example, if they smoke or they re eat the wrong diet, or even about who will benefit most based on the patient's status, for example, economically active or caring responsibilities, and then also the likelihood of compliance with treatment. All this happens in a relationship where, as this and other studies have highlighted, health professionals often lack appreciation of the lived realities of people experiencing poverty due to social distance. This can result in an inappropriate care plans, patients feeling judged for non-compliance and for not performing the behaviours expected them purely because they can't afford to. Next slide, please. So current pressures on the NHS have resulted in access to healthcare being challenging to almost all who use it. For those living on low incomes, these challenges are exacerbated in many ways, as demonstrated by this research. 
However, many of the barriers are inextricably linked to the cultures of healthcare systems. And by that, I mean the attitudes, customs and social behaviours of staff. And these compound the financial barriers experienced by low income families. These barriers are not inevitable and through greater attention to lived experiences of barriers, we are equipped with understanding about the steps that can be taken to address these. Hence, Children North East Poverty Proofing Healthcare. Next slide, please. So, next slide, please. Thank you for listening. So, I can take questions now. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Elaine. Thank you for that. Um, yes, so if anybody would like to ask any questions, feel free just to raise your hand or put it in the chat. We'll also just be popping in the chat now just a survey on today's session, but that's also the chance if you'd like just to suggest any future topics um, for speakers. Um, but while people are having a think about uh, any questions they might like to ask, I was just wondering myself, Elaine, because you mentioned that sort of training for health and care staff on this is an important thing. And I'm aware that there's health literacy training out there available in our, in our kind of area. But is, is the sort of that's only part of it is, is the more training that you're aware of that is available that we could make use of? Or is this something that needs developing, do you think? I mean, I kind of feel that. Um... There's lots of training, isn't there, about um, equalities training within the NHS. Yeah. And I do think this is something that isn't something that can almost be, um, you know, it can't be legislated mm. for. It's about personal behaviours and personal judgments. And most NHS staff do wonderfully, but all it takes is for somebody to meet one person and and quite often it's not the healthcare professional it's the the layer in front of the healthcare professional that yes. that the problems exist so i feel it's it's more about awareness raising and about mm. asking people to reflect on how they're they're behaving with um you know with people experiencing poverty and do they understand the challenges that they're facing yeah no, that's a good point. That's interesting. Um, no, thanks for that, Elaine. Yeah, no, that makes sense. It's, um, as I say, it's just because we've been involved in as a as a service kind of health literacy, but I hadn't quite, it, I'd sort of thought about it in these terms. But yeah, it's interesting to think about that a bit further in light of what you said. No, that's great. Thank you. So have we got any more questions? Um, Shauna says, thank you very much. Very interesting to listen to. So, <laughs> um, but I can't see any hands up or questions coming. Oh, yeah, Shauna's got one. Your hand up. Feel free if you want to I was ask, in the, Shauna. I was in the middle of uh, typing it, but I thought it would be quicker to say it. So going forward, <laughs> how is the health care providers going to ensure that poverty improves over time through, throughout what you've discussed? So one of the one of the things about this research was it was done with children northeast and children northeast have developed um, a, a sort of audit that they call poverty proofing and it's it, it began with schools and um you know basically one of the things was it, they helped schools to understand how the, how they were um marginalizing or creating barriers for their 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 pupils on low incomes mm -hmm. And so, for example, one of the things they did was when they got packed lunches, the children on free school meals used to get their packed lunches in a paper bag. And it was absolutely mm. obvious that they were, you know, they were on free school meals. So what the school did was buy loads of nice lunch boxes so that when they went on school trips, the children on free school meals got a plastic lunch box like all the other kids and didn't stand out so it's about these little things about treating people differently mm. to make them to equalize and so what poverty proofing does would go into an organization they would talk to the staff they would talk to patients and they would identify together the things that were causing problems in each sort of service 
So it's been done. I think it's been done um pediatric services in Newcastle. It's been done in speech and language therapy over in the northeast. And I know they're currently starting to do um poverty audit of maternity services at the RVI in Newcastle. So yeah, so that that's one of the things and you can contact for more information um Emma Leggett, who's on the slides, if you wanted to hear more. Thank you. Yeah, great. Oh, thanks, Elaine. Um, right, do we have any more questions? Oh, um, Kizzy Pine says, a very long overdue conversation. When I think about the cost of food in the hospital for those who have to hang around longer if they're using hospital transport, for example. Yep, good point. Yeah, even simple changes like having a water fountain and waiting room makes a big difference. Yes. And then Donna's asking if we can share the slides. Would you be happy if the slides were shared, Elaine? Of course they can, yes. Yes, yes, we can, Donna. Um, yeah, if you get in touch, Donna, we'll, we'll happily share them with you, absolutely. I think as well as that, one of the things it occurs to me, because the point about food is really important. And, and, you know, parents talked about, you know, the parents that are having to borrow money to get back and forwards from hospital or, you know, if they've arrived by emergency transport, um, if they've arrived, you know, on the 999, they've got nothing with them. And it's not a case of just calling someone and getting somebody to come in with it. And I think this was really exacerbated in rural areas. Mm. So when people are traveling long distances and then their family's miles away as well. And, you know, that happens all, all the time in Cumbria and, and places like Northumberland. Yeah, it's about, and, and there were very positive comments made, you know, but it, it always seems to come down to individuals. So if you arrive with nothing, you know, you've no change for the yes. vending machine and things, but, you know, some staff will take a lot of care and others will just let people get on with it and not see. So I think it is really very a personal approach here. Yes. Yeah. You have to look at each individual situation. Yeah. No, absolutely makes sense. No. Right, have we got any more questions? I think not. In which case, thank you very much for that, Elaine. That was great. Thank you. Pleasure. Um, thank you for listening, looks... everyone. And no, do no, get in very... touch if you want to discuss it more. Yeah, great. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Elaine. Yeah. And just um, a last shout out. So our next session will be on the 2nd of October at 1 p.m when we'll be joined by Alex Barker, who's Disability Consultant for AbilityNet on Introduction to Assistive Technology. Um, so if you can join us for that, please do so. And thank you all for coming. Thank you.